Welcome back to Monitors Unbox. Today we're checking out the Cooler Master Tempest GP27U, which fair to say has been a hotly anticipated monitor for high-end shoppers. This is the first sub $1,000 4K gaming display with decent full array local dimming, bringing 576 zones of mini LED goodness. For buyers looking to upgrade to a proper HDR gaming setup, this would likely have been in strong consideration since its announcement. The GP27U is one of those rare products that just seems to combine all the specs that someone would want. Maybe monitor manufacturers are finally listening to consumers and their rabid demand for actual HDR hardware. The basics here include a 27-inch 4K UHD 3840x2160 IPS LCD with a 576 zone full array local dimming backlight capable of over 1000 nits of brightness. There's also a quantum dot enhancement layer here further increasing its HDR capabilities up to a rated 98% DCI-P3 coverage. On the gaming side, the monitor supports up to a 160Hz refresh rate with adaptive sync features, although in the current firmware version, variable refresh is only enabled up to 144Hz. Bit of an odd one there, but 144Hz is still a great refresh rate for these sorts of specs. It's a flat panel as well, no need for any curve nonsense. The reason why this is such a talked about product right now is its price tag of just $800 US, which undercuts most other true HDR monitors that typically retail for over $1000. The zone count here is a bit lower than premium models, and the price tag is more than a non-HDR equivalent, but it feels like monitor enthusiasts have been waiting absolutely forever for a product like this to hit the market. Well it's here, and we're about to see whether it's any good. The design is pretty standard, Cooler Master really aren't trying anything fancy here. The stand is constructed from a nice metal and the base appears to be shaped like the Cooler Master logo. Size wise it's pretty similar to other square type bases we've seen from other monitors, but I guess it's more like a ring with a circular pillar. The front of the display is very basic and lets the display panel do the talking, with typical bezels on all sides and a matte anti-glare coating you'll be familiar with if you've used other desktop LCD monitors. I'm not a big fan of the rear of this monitor though, and the overall construction doesn't seem all that premium, with mostly basic black plastic, a few seams, and basic RGB LED elements. It's definitely a gamer type of design, but doesn't seem like an $800 product. It's not a big deal though, as you'll rarely see the back of the monitor, and I'd rather see compromises in design than display hardware. The stand has the full range of ergonomic adjustments including height, tilt, swivel and pivot, and it's quite a stable design as well which is good to see. The range of height adjust is only okay, though it does support VESA mounting. As for ports, Cooler Master includes one DisplayPort 1.4 with DSC and two full bandwidth 48 gigabits per second HDMI 2.1 ports plus USB Type-C that also does DP alt mode and 90 watts of power delivery. That's a great range of connectivity that should suit all types of users, whether we're talking PC, consoles or other devices. As for the on-screen display, it's controlled through a directional toggle on the rear. Cooler Master's OSD is a familiar design to several other brands I've seen, and includes a typical set of features by modern standards. We do see a range of color controls in various modes, plus settings for local dimming and so on. The game features include crosshairs, FPS counter, timer, there's a shadow boosting mode and a blue light filter, so all the things we see from other display vendors. There's also a KVM switch, but from some brief testing it seems a bit buggy and janky to use relative to other KVM setups. The response time section is pretty detailed here as there are many performance modes to go through. We'll start with the basic stuff, looking at 160Hz performance. The off mode has ok performance, but generally gamers will prefer overdrive enabled in some form, in which case the next mode, normal, is genuinely quite good. We're already seeing a 5.83 millisecond response average, negligible overshoot, great cumulative deviation, and even 73% refresh compliance, so this is a very usable setting at 160Hz but we can do better. The advanced mode bumps us up to a 4.45 millisecond average with an increase to overshoot as well, but generally inverse ghosting is not visible with such a low amount of overshoot. Cumulative deviation has improved relative to the normal mode, so this is what I'd recommend for 160Hz gaming. However, the ultra-fast mode I can't recommend, as it introduces significant and ugly overshoot. It's not usable in this configuration. For variable refresh rate gaming, the advanced mode is good for high refresh rates at or above 120Hz, but when we start getting to lower refreshes, overshoot creeps in which can be noticeable as minor inverse ghosting artifacts. It's not a big deal in this mode, 
but at 85 and 60 Hz, we see inverse ghosting rates above 30%, which is noticeable in practice. So while I would choose the advanced mode for high refresh rates, it's not optimal for general adaptive sync users, especially if you have a mid-range GPU. The normal mode is great across the entire refresh rate range though. While not as fast as the advanced mode for the top refreshers, we still get very good refresh compliance and much lower overshoot than advanced across the board. This makes lower refreshers like 85 and 60 Hz much more usable with minimal artifacts. This is the mode I'd choose for adaptive sync gamers, and I believe with this mode we do get a single overdrive mode experience, even though variable overdrive is not used. Yeah, variable overdrive likely would have improved performance, but I'm satisfied with these results. Speaking of variable overdrive, Cooler Master do provide a dynamic mode, however during testing this just enabled the advanced mode at all refresh rates. So I'm not sure what's dynamic about it, it doesn't appear to enable variable overdrive, if that's what you were thinking. There's also a user configurable overdrive setting, which can deliver minor optimizations compared to the built-in modes, but during my testing I wasn't able to give a notable boost to performance relative to normal or advanced. This will be more useful for people in very hot or very cold operating environments where the built-in modes won't deliver optimal performance and you can tweak it to your liking by using that user setting. Compared to other monitors, the GP27U delivers a very good response time experience with speeds similar to other 4K monitors but with low amounts of overshoot, testing at 160Hz. The panel used here is faster than some others, such as those used in the LG 27GP950, and roughly similar to that of the 28-inch models used in the M28U for example. On average across the refresh range, it's very similar, with the GP27U offering a good experience that's fast and with low overshoot. Other monitors, such as the M28U, are more limited in the overdrive options and do tend to push overshoot a bit higher, so it depends what balance you're looking for. Speaking of bounce and cumulative deviation, which measures this bounce between response times and overshoot, the GP27U slightly edges out the group of 28-inch 4K displays, though the advantage the Cooler Master display has is minimal. Performance is impressively similar to the Neo G7, which suggests great levels of optimization here even from the built-in normal mode we're using here. It doesn't give class above performance compared to other 27-inch 4K products, but it's good to confirm similar speeds are on offer. Also of interest is the comparison to a previous 4K HDR monitor in the Acer Predator X27. The GP27U is a generation faster here and offers an upgrade for those owners. 120Hz performance is important for console gamers and the GP27U offers a good experience, with decent response times and low overshoot, pretty similar to other offerings. It's a similar story at 60Hz, nothing chart topping, just a really solid experience at this refresh rate. Input latency is unimpressive on the GP27U. Here I'm testing in the SDR mode with local dimming disabled, and even in this condition, the GP27U has over 3 milliseconds of processing delay, which is higher than other products. It's not a terrible result, but this probably isn't a monitor you'd choose for competitive gaming as the refresh rate is too low. What's worse is HDR latency. When local dimming is active, the GP27U is much slower, with the processing delay increasing to 14 milliseconds. It isn't unusual for LCDs to have more input lag in their HDR modes with dimming enabled. The Neo G7 increases to nearly 10 milliseconds of lag. But this isn't a very good result. I'm not the most latency sensitive gamer, so this isn't a huge deal for me personally, but for those looking at this for some HDR competitive gameplay in AAA titles, this latency might be an issue. Power consumption is nothing crazy despite the use of a mini LED backlight, which typically increases power consumption compared to traditional displays. The GP27U actually uses less power than the X27 as it emits the G-Sync module, though you are still looking at about a 10 watt increase over non-HDR options of the same panel size. This isn't a huge deal as power consumption is manageable on this display, even in the HDR mode, which doesn't exceed 100 watts to show over 1000 nits. The GP27U does not support backlight strobing technology, which is pretty typical for an HDR-enabled FALD backlight LCD. This is a trade-off to achieve good HDR performance on modern displays. Maybe we'll see strobing reintroduced at some point, but right now, this isn't a common feature on HDR monitors. Color performance is next up, and the GP27U happens to be an extremely wide gamut monitor. We're not only getting 98.7% DCI-P3 coverage, which is one of the widest results I've recorded, but 99% Adobe RGB coverage as well, giving us great coverage of two popular wide color spaces.
In total, we get 85% Rec 2020 coverage, which so far is the highest recorded coverage I've tested in a gaming monitor. The quantum dots here are doing great work to enhance the color space. Out of the box accuracy is interesting. Grayscale performance is excellent, with the GP27U reporting a relatively flat CCT curve and decent adherence to the sRGB gamma curve. This leads to low delta E's, an ITP average of just 3.58 is very strong for a gaming display. However, this display does ship with its wide gamut fully unlocked by default, so there is significant oversaturation when viewing regular SDR content in the SDR mode. This display has such a wide color gamut that some areas are obviously oversaturated, such as common skin tones which typically appear redder than usual on this display. High delta E's in the saturation and color checker tests are also not a surprise. Compared to other displays, factory grayscale performance is excellent, and I'm glad Cooler Master put in some work there. However, color checker performance is quite weak due to its wide gamut mode being used by default. The GP27U includes several display modes for other color gamuts, including sRGB, DCI-P3, actually D65-P3 based on my testing, and Adobe RGB. I'm going to focus on the sRGB mode here, but the other modes have similar results relative to their color gamuts. In the sRGB mode, there is a slight reduction to grayscale performance with higher delta E's, mostly coming from changes to white balance. It's still decent overall though. As for the gamut clamping ability, the sRGB mode is okay, but the clamp reduces gamut coverage in the reds too aggressively, which is also the case for the P3 and Adobe RGB modes. This limits total color space to 91% sRGB, which is mediocre. The accuracy of this mode otherwise is acceptable, though again it's disappointing some areas to color control, such as white balance, are disabled when the sRGB mode is used. For a proper calibrated experience that delivers the full sRGB gamut, a software calibration is required and we used CalMAN for this. Doing this provided the best experience in the color managed apps and a single profile can access all of the sRGB P3 and Adobe RGB capabilities, plus the calibrated results are generally pretty good here, especially for grayscale as not a huge amount of adjustment was required. You're not going to be able to achieve excellent hardware calibrated results, but for color accurate work this monitor's wide gamut provides a lot of versatility for those that need multiple color gamuts. I should also mention here that using local dimming in the SDR mode leads to bad color performance, and I wouldn't recommend doing this. Coolmaster does not enable dimming in the SDR mode by default, and we tested with dimming disabled. There are gamma issues when using this combination that appears to blow out the display. Generally, I don't recommend dimming for SDR anyway, as flaws with local dimming are more noticeable in desktop apps with high contrast edges than they are playing games or watching videos in the HDR mode. Maximum brightness was strong, coming in at 586 nits, which is very high for an SDR monitor and well exceeds what most people would actually use under normal conditions. It's not that much higher than some other HDR capable monitors, but it's great nonetheless. Minimum brightness could be better though, it bottoms out at just 68 nits. As for native contrast ratio from this panel, the GP27U provides 1080 to 1 after calibration, which is standard from an IPS of today. So if you're using the monitor with local dimming disabled, or you're viewing content where local dimming is ineffective, you can expect a fairly low contrast ratio, definitely much lower than a VA LCD or OLED. Having those mini LEDs is essential for good HDR performance here. Viewing angles are good, but don't expect anything outrageous. This is your typical IPS viewing experience, which these days tends to provide great viewing angles. Uniformity was solid, the center section didn't deviate much from the middle on my unit, with a small amount of fall off around the edges, particularly the bottom right edge, though this can vary from unit to unit. Moving now into HDR performance, and this is obviously a huge selling point of the GP27U, and probably the main reason you'd buy it. The good news is that the hardware provided here is genuinely capable of true HDR and offers all three pillars of HDR to an acceptable level. Brightness exceeds 1000 nits, color space is strong thanks to well over 80% Rec 2020 coverage, and contrast is enhanced due to the 576 zone full array local dimming mini LED backlight. The zones here are arranged into a 32 by 18 grid with each zone responsible for roughly 15,000 pixels, a modest zone count, but it's effective for HDR. By far the biggest issue with the GP27U is the firmware problems using it in the HDR mode. Enabling HDR in the first place is quite janky, the monitor needs to be in the auto mode for HDR to work properly, but leaving it in this mode for SDR causes issues. So it's not so much an auto mode, but an on mode. This makes it difficult to easily switch between HDR and SDR modes while preserving great image quality. 
Secondly, you cannot use HDR and adaptive sync at the same time. This is a deal breaker for the monitor and it's baffling how it was shipped in this condition given how vital variable refresh rates are to PC gaming experiences. Any attempt to enable VRR and HDR at the same time will disable one or the other feature. So to use HDR, you have to accept that variable refresh won't work, at least in the current firmware. This is on top of the 160Hz mode also not being available with Adaptive Sync. Cooler Master told me that a firmware update enabling HDR and variable refresh at the same time would be provided this month. However, as the monitor is currently available and shipping to users in this condition, we opted to review it using the current firmware. We prefer not to review products based on the promises of the manufacturer, rather what it can do right now, especially if the product is in the hands of buyers already. The reasoning for preventing HDR and variable refresh at the same time was also concerning to me. Cooler Master told me that it was the team being conservative and that they wanted to minimize any possible flickering that may come with activating local dimming in combination with Adaptive Sync. I hope this doesn't mean the GP27U will flicker at times with HDR and Adaptive Sync enabled, but we'll have to see what happens when the firmware ships. We'll be sure to test it thoroughly. Putting aside the firmware problems for now, how does the GP27U look in its HDR mode? Pretty good, thanks to its FALD backlight. We're getting a strong combination of high peak brightness and dimming ability that makes most HDR content look great. This is a clear step up over fake HDR monitors and semi-HDR products with edge-lit dimming. It's really a night and day comparison. 576 zones is far superior for HDR than pathetic 16 or 32 zone configurations. It's more than an order of magnitude tighter dimming than those products. There are several key battles to explore though. The GP27U looks clearly better than the Sony Inzone M9 in challenging HDR conditions, with 576 zones providing a large improvement over 96 zones. So if you're tossing up between these two at a similar price, the GP27U is better for HDR. Less blooming and haloing and brighter content is possible on the Cooler Master option. I also believe the GP27U provides superior dimming to the Acer Predator X27 with its 384 zones from what feels like a century ago, so this could actually be an upgrade option for those owners. As for the GP27U compared to higher end options like the Samsung Odyssey Neo G7 or OLED options, the GP27U has a more basic HDR experience, more entry level, even though entry level doesn't really apply when we're talking about an $800 monitor. The Neo G7 has over a thousand dimming zones and OLEDs have per pixel dimming. 576 zone monitors like this just can't deliver the same level of dimming ability as those products and the Neo G7 with its VA panel also helps increase contrast in difficult situations. In a practical sense, the GP27U is pretty similar to these higher-end monitors when HDR content is brighter or doesn't have especially small bright objects on screen. In many situations that I tested, I'd say the GP27U has a really good HDR presentation with good contrast. It's when scenes get more difficult that the GP27U's more limited zone count can be exposed. Large areas of dark shadow detail right next to bright objects can reveal some blooming into the dark areas, which is a lot less noticeable on the highest end HDR products. Subtitles and letterboxing can cause issues here too, depending on the content. Then we also see problems with star fields and Christmas lights, which look better on the Neo G7, but only really shine on OLEDs. Really any scenes that include small bright elements, smaller than the zone size, aren't optimal on this sort of HDR monitor. During my time using the GP27U, I did notice blooming at times, so I'd expect similar if you end up buying one, but I don't think that should take away from what is otherwise a good value HDR experience. This monitor gives a substantial upgrade over SDR and does give you the true benefit of HDR, just not all of the time, like you might see from a higher end product. Let's put some numbers to this discussion. Firstly, we need to assess which HDR mode is the best, given there are three local dimming settings. These settings adjust the peak brightness on offer and slightly tweak EOTF tracking, with the high setting offering the highest brightness. I found the medium setting to offer the best experience. It only drops peak brightness by a few hundred nits compared to high, still well over a thousand nits, but more closely follows the EOTF curve in the mid to upper range. The low local dimming mode is dimmer not just for peak brightness, but also most of the upper EOTF range. The medium mode is what we'll be using for testing, and here's a look at how the monitor fares for dark content, pretty similar to the high mode here. Black levels are raised somewhat compared to where they should be, so shadow detail isn't as rich as on some other HDR monitors that push low luminance content darker. Color accuracy is also average, it's not terrible, it's fine for HDR gaming. 
Full screen sustained brightness is excellent with the GP27U capable of over 1000 nits, which is better than most other HDR monitors I've tested and significantly superior to OLEDs. This level of brightness is held for peak flashes, in fact there is no difference between peak and sustained brightness for this display. What's impressive is that for 10% windows, brightness increases to nearly 1500 nits in the medium dimming mode, which is well above many other products except for the eye scorching PG32 UQX. It's actually higher than the Neo G7 by over 200 nits. For all window sizes, we get over 900 nits from this monitor, which is very strong levels of brightness, no issues here. For best case single frame contrast, the GP27U provides a good result, though not as good as the best HDR monitors. With a result of about 150,000 to 1, this exceeds our minimum requirement for a true HDR product. When any part of the screen is illuminated, all zones do appear to be active but at a very low luminance level to show black, so this prevents an essentially infinite contrast ratio in this test. But nevertheless, it's a good result. In worst case tests, the GP27U doesn't fare as well. When dark and bright objects are close together, the GP27U's moderate zone size leads to only a 3 times improvement in contrast compared to native. The PG32 UQX with twice the number of zones gets about a 5 times improvement, while the Neo G7 is a great monitor thanks to its combination of 1196 FLD zones and VA technology. While this is only a mid-table result, the GP27U has clearly better dimming abilities than any of the fake HDR products that sit below it, and even beats some of the basic HDR monitors out there such as the Predator X27 and Inzone M9. In the checkerboard test, again the GP27U sits about in the middle of the table, providing around a 2.4 times increase on native contrast. That's a good result, but I think the low, high brightness checkerboard numbers compared to the best HDR monitors is indicative of how you're more likely to see blooming on the GP27U than the best HDR products. Does the Neo G7 look 7.5 times better for HDR content? That's rarely the case, but in tricky scenarios that monitor does indeed produce better visuals. Final section of this review is the Hub Essentials checklist, which looks to see if Cooler Master are advertising this monitor correctly and whether they are meeting basic performance standards. In the first two sections, they don't run into many issues with largely accurate advertising. Factory calibration is a borderline result. Cooler Master advertised Delta E is less than 2, which is possible using the Delta E2000 standard, but less so using Delta E ITP that we use. The motion performance section is problematic though. The GP27U is advertised as a 1 millisecond monitor, and while it is fast, 1 milliseconds is not achievable using practical settings. At best, this is a 2 millisecond display. Input lag is less than ideal even without local dimming enabled, variable refresh is not supported in the HDR mode, and there's no backlight strobing. However, the HDR section is great, as this is a true HDR product. Cooler Master are even a bit conservative with HDR brightness, I was easily able to exceed 1200 nits in testing. The final segment covers issues and defects. While there are no apparent hardware problems like weird subpixel arrays, flickering or pixel inversion, there were a few too many firmware bugs, issues and limitations for my liking, so I've labelled this monitor as having moderate firmware problems. It's usable, but some of the things you'd expect to work together like HDR and variable refresh, or 160Hz and variable refresh, are not accessible. The Cooler Master Tempest GP27U is certainly a very interesting product, and there's good reason why this is a hotly discussed display in the monitor community right now. It has a lot of good hardware capabilities and strong specs at a really attractive price, but can I recommend you actually buy it? Right now, the answer to that is comfortably no. The inability to run the HDR mode in conjunction with Adaptive Sync and the full 160Hz refresh rate is a deal breaker to me and is not what I'd expect from an $800 product. Variable refresh rate support is crucial for smooth gaming, especially at 4K, where often you'll be unable to run at the maximum refresh rate, so having to choose between that and HDR is an unacceptable compromise. There's also other firmware-related jankiness here that gives the impression this monitor, which is available to purchase right now and is shipping to customers, is more of a beta release than a finalized product. Now, Cooler Master do say they are working on a firmware update to allow HDR and Adaptive Sync to work together, but to be honest, this firmware should have been available before the monitor shipped to customers. It's a huge oversight, and I wasn't exactly relieved to hear that the HDR and VRR combination was disabled to be conservative and minimize any possible flickering. 
There's still a lot of question marks there and I'd advise buyers not to purchase this monitor until we can confirm the firmware update works as intended. If you're watching this video several weeks after we publish it, check the description and comments for any further updates. With all of that said, if Cooler Master were able to address this issue without introducing other problems, the GP27U would be an excellent monitor that's worth buying. The key selling point here is the true HDR experience at a lower than typical price, and I was quite impressed with what it can do in that area. 576 zones of full array local dimming provides a significant step up over an SDR experience or horrible edge lit dimming. And in conjunction with dazzling brightness, the GP27U is capable of both decent shadow detail and very bright highlights. It doesn't have the same excellent tight dimming as some premium HDR displays, but this HDR experience is definitely worth paying extra for compared to a basic 4K SDR gaming monitor. Cooler Master have also been able to deliver solid performance in other areas. Response times are great for an LCD and appear well optimized even in the included modes, let alone dabbling in the user customizable mode. It has a good refresh rate and the only lingering concern is input lag, though for some gamers that will be a non-issue, especially as for HDR gaming, input lag tends to be a common problem. I was impressed with how wide the color gamut is here, providing great coverage of sRGB, P3 and Adobe RGB, plus a whopping 85% Rec 2020 coverage. Factory grayscale calibration is really solid, brightness is excellent and viewing angles are good. Aside from a few issues with the built-in modes and using dimming with SDR content, the GP27U is a pretty versatile monitor for content consumption as well as productivity. All of this is being offered for $800 US, which is a great price, and ends the Sony InZone M9's short-lived place as a good option for HDR gaming below $1,000. Right now, there really isn't any competition to the GP27U. If you want 4K true HDR around $800, this is the option. But it's also a fair price, because the monitors you can get for above $1,000, like the LG C2 OLED, Samsung Neo G7, Alienware AW3423DW, they're all a step up from the GP27U in performance, sometimes substantially so. $800 feels right, you're getting a good deal here. It's now over to Cooler Master to fix the issues with the GP27U's firmware, so we can recommend that you buy it. Stay tuned for our updates on that one, as we'll be retesting the display right here on Monitors Unboxed as soon as the update is available. Anyway, that's it for this one. If you do appreciate our independent testing of monitors like the GP27U, please do consider subscribing to the channel and also supporting us directly via our Patreon and Floatplan accounts. We will gain access to some cool things like a Discord community, monthly live streams, ICC profiles, and more. Also, a lot of the products that we talked about, we do have links for in the description below so you can check their current prices. And yeah, that's pretty much it for this one. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.